I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a channel member today to get access to some really cool perks. The link is in the video description. I'm a current employee of the Washington State Fishery Service, and I had a scary encounter with a Bigfoot in the Canyon Creek area. I don't mind telling you about it, because I don't work in that area, and I was camping at the time. I live pretty far away from the Canyon Creek area, but I've always wanted to try some fly fishing and camping around there. So early last spring, I decided to use some of my time off to spend a few days or so camping and fishing down there. Suffice to say, camping only lasted two days until I saw something that I hope to never see again. I also want to warn people about it, without losing my livelihood. I want to let people know that these things are real, and they can be dangerous. The location of the encounter was east of Amboy, Washington, near the Canning Creek campgrounds. The site was clean, the scenery was perfect, and the fishing during the first day was awesome, and the trip only took all morning and a little past noon to get to from where I lived. I'm an avid fisherman, and I love it. Give me a fly fishing pole, flies that I've tied myself, and a great place to cast, and I'm in heaven. I will travel to anywhere if the fishing is good and if the atmosphere is peaceful to fly fishing. As a matter of fact, I have a huge passion for all things outdoors. So, I love my job with the fisheries. It suits me just fine. So, with four days off coming up, I decided to head out to a little place a friend of mine told me about, the Canyon Creek area. It's full of little fishing holes here and there. He said it was a nice place to fish and just be. Most importantly, he told me about the trout that he pulled out of there, and it averaged over 12 inches long, and that sounded great to me. I had from Thursday to late Sunday evening to enjoy the camping and fishing, so I headed out early just before daybreak. It took me some time to get there from where I lived. It was a rather uneventful trip, and although it would rain off and on for the next few days, the drive was almost all sunshine. By the time I arrived at the campground, I got signed in and headed to my site, it was getting late in the day already, and it would be dark in just a few hours. Personally, I wanted to get at least an hour of fishing in before it got dark. I set up camp, that included the one-person tent and the bedding inside. After that, I gathered a little wood and cut up some kindling, and headed out to the little fishing hole. It was a honey hole indeed. Within 25 minutes, I had caught two fish, and I kept the 13-inch trout for dinner. I packed it in just as the sun was setting, I had to pull up my flashlight and use it heading back on the trail to my camp. The camping area was not packed with people at this point. The middle of the week is usually slow just about anywhere during the late summer, running into mid-September. I was going to relish the quietness and peacefulness of it all, or so I thought. I was barely there a few hours, and then the craziness would start, and the scariest thing I had ever experienced up to this point of my life would begin. I had my tent set up at the back of the camping area near the trail in the thick brush. As I was done eating, I noticed headlights coming down the dirt driveway. I automatically assumed they were leaving as that was the direction for the entry point to the campgrounds. And I was right, but I was also warned. The car came up and slowed to a complete stop right in front of my camp. It was a nice looking SUV and inside was a young couple that looked like they were on a getaway from the city. As they stopped, they lowered their window. They seemed upset and honestly really scared. They told me they were leaving and warning the few others that were left in the camp that there was some wild animal roaming around. They said that it had torn up their camp that morning while they were away on a hike. They also mentioned hearing strange clicking noises and whistles the night before all around their campsite. Of course, being part of the fisheries, I automatically assumed that it was a bear although the clicking sounds and whistles I attributed to people. I mentioned to them what I did for a living and assured them I could handle myself. While they understood, I don't think that I convinced them of my own safety out here. I thanked them kindly and they sped off into the night. I sensed and heard nothing that night while enjoying the fire. It was not until the wee hours of the morning that I would wake to the whistles of someone or something. It was a very interesting whistle for sure. They were loud enough to wake me out of my sleep, so you could tell they were close by. As an employee of the fishery services, I'm trained and educated. Not to mention, I've grown up in the forests of this state, and I know a ton about being out here. I know the sounds of the forest, and this did not sound like a bird at all. 
They were short whistles, but not as crisp and clear as a bird or like a person. I sat up, unzipped my tent, and stepped out in the early morning. It stopped. No more whistling after that. Although it sounded strange, I thought it was a person walking around and must have figured out that they were close to someone's camp and left the area. After that, I continued with my morning and into the day of great fishing. I took a break here and there to have lunch or just walk around a bit. I even took a nap next to a fire back at camp. By late afternoon, I was back to fishing again. This is when the clicking and whistling sounds started up again. They were not rocks. The clicking sounds were made vocally, I can assure you. It was like a tongue-in-cheek clicking sounds that people make. Only these seemed to echo through the forest around me. Where I was fishing was basically in a large pool, so the sound of rushing water was minimal at best. It was interesting. I could hear the whistles from up behind me, and then the clicks would come from across the creek, not too far away. I couldn't see any movement, but the whistling persisted. I started to feel a little uneasy, so I decided to pack it in and head back to camp. It was getting dark, so I grabbed my stringed fish and headed back. The whistling continued, but the clicking soon disappeared as I walked along the trail. I would cook both the trout that I caught that night and throw a little rice into the mix with it. It was well after dinner, and I was reading a new fly fishing guidebook by the fire when the clicking started up again. This time, however, it would not stop with just the clicking. It was close by this time, and I thought at one point, by the light of the fire, I could make out movement. It was across a road just past the other campsite. I couldn't make out anything other than movement, so I was not sure if it was a person. I was also a little freaked out, but not scared yet, just a little uncomfortable. I decided it was time to stoke up the fire and head to bed. Maybe whoever or whatever it was might get bored and leave. Panic and fear. That's what I was feeling about four hours later in the middle of the night. I cannot believe what happened when looking back on that night. The tent was jolted so hard my head went from the top of the tent down to the bottom. Something grabbed the back corner of my tent, yanked it, and tried dragging it off with me still inside it. I yelled, hey, as loud as I could, and it seemed to have dropped my tent. I heard footsteps walking at a fast pace through the woods to the east until I could hear them no longer. The tent and me were dragged about ten feet or so. I found the zipper to the tent which was upside down with me in it. I crawled out quickly and made my way to my car where I decided to arm myself with my bear spray and flashlight that was under the passenger seat. No gun this weekend. I was dragged and I kept thinking, what in the world is going to drag me out here other than a person? No bear was going to do that. I mean, they could, but no, it had to have been a person for sure. I could hear the footsteps walking away at a fast pace, and at that moment I thought to myself that there was some deranged lunatic running around Camp Crystal Lake. I was scared to death. That's when I knew that I had to calm down and start thinking about my safety. That young couple in the SUV were correct. I guess I should have made less fun of them in my mind. I did research later on the subject of Bigfoot and how they've been known to charge people and I want you to know that I believe they leave a whole lot out of the reports, like the moment you peer yourself out of pure terror and what it's like to feel like you're about to lose your life. It was coming back. I could hear it crashing through the woods, and I knew it was not a person, and that it was on two legs. This thing was extremely heavy, you could tell. I could hear the heavy footsteps over the crashing through the thick brush and small trees. I tried to put myself downwind of whatever it was, not so that it couldn't smell me out, but because it can help the bear spray spread faster through the breeze. It came into a part of the clearing of the trail where I'd already sprayed some of the bear spray. It came to a complete stop about 30 feet from me on the trail that led back down towards the creek. Before I tell you what it looked like, I must tell you, I was right. This thing was heavy. And I say that because of how massive it was. It was over 8 feet tall. I know that they say the average Bigfoot is around 7 to 8 feet, but this thing was 9 feet plus. The moment that I shined my light on it, I realized how massive it was. It put out a loud growl that I swear vibrated right through me, and as it did, it went to all fours and charged me. Not far, about 10 feet maybe, but it only took a step and a half to make it there. It was like a leap and a step all at once, and it was fast. It'd be at that moment that I thought I was going to die. 
I literally peed myself. Embarrassing to say, but I want you to know how serious of a situation I was in and how frightening these things are. The bluff charge ended with a scream that should have made me crumble to my knees, but I felt as though I had to stand my ground or else I would probably be killed. Either that or I was in panic mode and frozen from fear. Working for the fishery services, we were taught how to act and defend ourselves against certain wild animals. In this situation, I felt like I should stare back and stand there as still as I could. The thing looked to weigh more than 500 pounds, and the shoulders were at least four feet wide. It was hard to look directly at this thing. I just wanted to look away and hope for the best. I did have my flashlight on it, and I was not going to move it. I do remember that it was only human-like in stature. It was on two feet, except when it went to charge me. The eyes were large, and the hair covered its entire body, even most of its face around its eyes. There was no neck that I could see, and the head just sat on top of the shoulders, and it seemed to have a slight cone shape on top. I could not tell the exact hair color, but I think it was reddish-brown. I was far too scared to really notice the color, to tell you the truth. It had canines. When it screamed, I could see them. I felt a sound wave hit me like a truck. That's when I really got scared. Those teeth could tear me in half in a second if those long, muscular arms did not first. By the way, the arms were long. I noticed long fingers, but no claws that I can recall. I was afraid for my life, though so staring at this thing for too long was out of the question. I did stand my ground, and I kept my eyes down in the direction of its feet for the most part. They were huge, too. After a few more seconds, the creature grunted and slapped its chest. At least that is what it sounded like. It then turned and crashed its way back through the woods in the direction it came from. I was starting to go into shock, so I grabbed my keys and a blanket, wrapped it around me, got into my car, and left. I left everything behind and drove home. Bigfoot is real. I believe it's simply an undiscovered primate of sorts. I never said anything to my co-workers, let alone my higher-ups. What I do know is that I'm all the wiser now when I'm out and about in the forest today. I never go fishing, camping, or even for a picnic out here without a gun in the car or on my hip. Not that it would stop something so massive. Personally, I'm with the majority out there that believe it would only make this thing angrier if you shoot it. I guess I just feel safer with it, is all. Approximate year 2000, I can't really recall the exact year, but I'm thinking it was over 10 or so years ago. I was about 15 or so. The town we lived in is a very, very backwater town, seriously. You're either a rancher, a logger, a miner, or a welfare recipient. There are, of course, a few doctors and lawyers, and those that work in the schools and a few various businesses in town. And because of the small size of the town, there was nothing for younger folks to do besides the typical outdoor stuff like hiking and camping. But teenagers can only do that sort of thing so long before getting bored. However, there's a good-sized town just right over the Canadian border no more than 10 miles away, with a movie theater, fast food restaurants, and the feeling that you aren't in a redneck community like the one we called home. On this particular night of the encounter, myself, my best friend, and his older brother were on our way back from this particular town. The road we were following runs along the Kettle River. We were heading north along the winding road. The river was on our right, while on the left there was a base of the mountain range. The canyon is narrow, no more than about a mile at its widest and less than half at its narrowest. Since my best friend and I were not old enough to drive, his brother packed the three of us into his standard Toyota truck for our night out in Canada. I was riding shotgun while my friend sat in the middle. His brother, who was five years older than us, was visiting home from college, was behind the wheel. We were speeding along the road, his brother had a bit of a lead foot, so we were clipping along at a rather rapid pace. We were just listening to music while discussing things of no great importance, just chit-chatting the way boys do. During a period of silence, as we made our way parallel to the river, I was looking out the passenger seat window watching the full moon reflect off the river. My lunar observance was broken through by my friend's brother. What the F is that? he screamed while slamming on the brakes. I was wearing my seatbelt, so the sudden deceleration caused my body to lurch forward rather rapidly and the centrifugal force caused my head to pivot, so I was looking directly out the windshield. The truck fishtailed slightly before the driver brought it to a complete stop in the middle of the road. There, about 40 yards down the pavement, we saw a thing. 
It was about seven feet tall and covered in dark brown fur. My first thought was, whoa, a grizzly bear. Even though this part of Washington is not home to grizzlies, there were reports of them being spotted here and there. A hunter shot one about 10 miles over the Canadian border a few years back. So for us, this was a real treat. But this was no grizzly. It turned by pivoting at the waist and faced us. It was walking diagonally from the right side of the road and heading left. I could make out the features. It had a very human-like face. Not the muzzle of a bear, and yet it was vaguely ape-like. It walked steadily and without breaking its stride on two legs. I can see the five fingers, the opposable thumb, and the arms swaying back and forth as it moved. We sat there in silence for a few seconds as it moved. Our driver gunned the engine and we darted towards it. There was about 30 feet of clearing before the tree thicket, and this creature made it across the gap and up the hill in what seemed like two seconds. The driver hit the brakes again just as we reached the point where it stepped off the road and turned the engine off, and for some reason, God knows why, killed the lights. It was a summer night so the windows were rolled down and we could hear it running, not too stealthily through the woods away from us. We could hear what sounded like panting and grunting, like the way a large animal would do with excursion. We sat there listening in silence until the noise just stopped completely. Whatever it was must have known we were listening for it and became still. Smell that? My friend sitting next to me asked. Yes, I said. Smells like shit, the driver said. And it did. Literally. It smelled like fecal matter and an unwashed, dirty person. Very pungent and overpowering. Dude, let's get out of here, I remember saying. I was beginning to get paranoid and envisioned being ripped out of the car by some hairy beast. After about another minute of sitting, the driver relented and started the engine and we drove off. When we got back to their parents' house, we related the story. None of them believed us, of course. Their family all said we were imagining it, or it was a mistaken identity of a bear or something. That valley we lived in had many strange occurrences that were reported. I was staying at the same friend's house one night when the two of us and his dad witnessed a UFO in the sky. And many people say there's a correlation between both Bigfoot and UFOs. However, the UFO phenomenon we saw happened about two years later, so we didn't think the two events were really related. To this day, the three of us still tell the story, and whenever we get together for drinks, we discuss it, and always clink our glasses together for our first beverage and say, Two Bigfoot. We told several people at school about it the following Monday, including teachers and students. Some believed us, having stories of their own, while most didn't. Well, in a nutshell, that's my story. I do have another that I would like to share. It gives me the creeps. Like I said earlier, there isn't a whole lot of employment opportunity for high school kids in the area I grew up. This particular summer, some friends were working for one of the larger ranching families in the valley. We went to high school with this one rancher's kids and nephews. We spent the day bucking bales, worst job in the world in my opinion, on a hot summer day. When we were finished for the night, we sat around while the missus of the house served us a good wholesome farm family meal. At the table, I told of the incident that happened with me, my friend, and his brother, which happened about two years previous. While I told the story, the rancher sat and listened intently. After I was finished, he was the only one at the table who didn't tell me I was full of bull. His wife and kids said that he had a weird thing happen to him as well. Of course, none of them really believed him. His story, it was about five years before that evening we all gathered for dinner. One of his cattle got killed by a cougar the night before, and he wanted to dispose of the corpse, hoping it would leave the area. He had a special place about a mile or two up a windy mountain road where he buried the bodies of slain animals, not wanting them too close to his home and attracting other scavengers and predators. The carcass was a rather large cow and was partially eaten. He had to carry it up the windy mountain road with his tractor. While he was disposing of the carcass, he had the weirdest feeling he was being watched and was attempting to finish the task quickly because of the heebie-jeebies he was feeling. Amid the hard work, he decided to take a pee break and hopped down off the tractor and walked a few yards away to relieve himself. As he was doing so, a rock about the size of a golf ball landed near him. He looked around frantically, not seeing anything. He wanted to get out of there as fast as he could, but had to finish the task at hand. Going against his instincts, he continued to bury the cow. When he was finished, he swung the tractor around to head home, and again a rock was thrown at him, this one actually hitting him in the shoulder and then the neck. He looked over from where the rock's trajectory came from, and he saw what he first thought was a man dressed in a heavy coat. He was about to yell at him and ask him why he was on his ranch and why the hell he thought it was okay to throw rocks at him and that he's lucky he didn't get shot. He had a 30-30 Winchester with him. But on further scrutiny, he noticed that it was not a man at all. 
His description was dead on to the one I gave earlier, except that he said the fur was more red than brown. As fast as he could, he drove away from the animal and down the winding road. The road snakes back and forth most of the way down the mountain, leading back to his house, and the entire time he was driving, he would see something following him through the woods as if it was chasing him out of the area. Every time he would come up on a turn, it would be standing there about 20 feet off the road, beating him to the turn. It must have walked in a straight line down the mountain was his reasoning for it meeting him at each turn. He felt a sense of hostility coming from it. Finally, when he reached a straight stretch, he gunned it, looking back, not seeing it following him. He was relieved it didn't follow him, at least during the daylight. That night, he had to go out and do a few tasks before nightfall, not wanting to because of his encounter earlier in the day, but knowing he had to, such is a rancher's life. It was just before nightfall, and he was just finishing his chores when his three dogs started going nuts and took off towards the field. They were gone for no more than 15 seconds when they returned very frightened and whimpering. One of them nearly knocked him down while trying to hide under his legs. Once again, he saw the thing, standing there about 50 yards away, unmoving. He wasn't armed this time and was so scared that he nearly wet himself, he said. They stood there looking at one another for what he said seemed like an eternity, before it lazily walked away and back toward the area he previously encountered it. He didn't tell his wife about the encounter for some weeks. The only reason he did was because another rancher about 10 miles away actually reported a sighting of his own. Even though she never really believed him, she says that he believed it, and when he told the story, she could see he was genuinely afraid of what he experienced. That was the only reason she could have maybe almost believed him. It was his sincerity. He was a tough, ranch-raised good old boy who hunted, farmed, fished, and camped all his life. He wasn't afraid of anything the wilderness could throw at him, but this scared him, and he's not afraid to admit that to this day. He will still not go up to that area alone, and if he absolutely has to, he takes his dogs and a firearm with him. I've gone up there a few times, and the place just feels creepy. Maybe it's just because of his story and my own experience psyching me out, or maybe something is really there still. Who knows? Hi, my name is Audra, and this is my story. Me and my boyfriend had spent the day at Senecaville Lake in Ohio. Not long before we left, we got into an argument. We packed up and argued for a few minutes more in the car as we drove away. We hadn't gone too far when he said something incredibly stupid. I got mad and told him to stop, and then I'd rather walk. So he pulled over, and I got out, and he drove off. While we were at the lake during the day, I had left my purse in the car locked up, and I did remember to take it with me when I got out of the car. However, while arguing and packing up to leave, I had thrown my cell phone in a tote bag, which was still now in the car. I was mad and not thinking while we were arguing, and I was just throwing stuff everywhere as we packed up, and when I realized that, I could have kicked myself. So there I was out in the middle of nowhere in the dark, and no way to call for a ride. So I did what I said I was going to do, and I started walking. I was on 761, or some know it as Keenansburg Road. The first section wasn't too bad. It was pretty open, and I passed a few houses, and then a wide area of open land. After that, it was all lined with trees on both sides of the road. At first, I was still so mad and thinking about everything that we had argued about that it didn't bother me. But after a while, I started to hear stuff off to the side of me in the trees. It sounded like something walking along. I tried to keep walking, but after a few minutes, I knew something was definitely over there in the trees. Although there wasn't much in the way of cars coming and going, I chanced it and started walking as best as I could down the middle of the road. I did not want to be near the edge. I had visions of something grabbing me. I was now really regretting getting out of the car, and I was now also angry with him for letting me get out and walk. I know that makes no sense, but I was mad at him now all over again. I also felt like I was in some scary movie, but I was stuck. There was no lights out there anywhere, and there was nothing nearby to run to except the trees, and I was not going in there. More than once, I felt like something was behind me. It was so dark out there, there were no lights, and something could have been ten feet behind me, and I probably wouldn't have known it. It was so dark, I stepped off the road a few times, and only knew it by how it felt when I walked. It was that kind of dark. The kind only a rural road with no ambient light for a mile or more can possibly be. 
I just kept walking. And a car did come down the road, and I did try to get them to stop, but they didn't. They probably thought it was a scary horror movie, too. The first rule in a horror movie, never pick up someone on a dark night. By that time, I was in tears and scared. I tried to go from memory to guess how far it was to the next area of houses, but I just didn't know. I had driven this way many times, but I didn't know the distance. It had all just been background. I did begin to smell something, but not like others have described. This was the smell of a dog, but not a wet dog. It was a dusty, furry smell. When I smelled that, I really became scared. I wasn't thinking Bigfoot so much as maybe coyote or bear. I didn't know exactly what was in the area, if anything, but I knew then something was behind me. I can't say how I knew, but I had goosebumps on my arms, and I swear I could hear and feel it breathing. I turned around, and while it was dark, I could tell something was only a few feet behind me. It was big, really big. I think I might have screamed, and I turned and began to run. I don't know if that was the right thing to do or not, and I wasn't even questioning it. I just ran. I saw headlights again, and again they would not stop. As they passed, I too came to a stop and turned and watched their brake lights. I was hoping that maybe they were stopping after all. But the side benefit was that I could watch the glow of their headlights and as it lit up the sides of the road. Now, they probably couldn't see what I saw because it was standing well off the side of the road, but I saw a Bigfoot in the trees. I'm not sure the distance. I'm not the kind of person who can tell how many yards or feet, but it was a couple of car lengths behind me. It had turned slightly away from the road as the car passed, and it was just standing next to a tree. But I saw that eye shine for a moment. Seeing a Bigfoot, that's scary on its own. But seeing it in just a flash of light, and then it's all darkness? That's a fear that's indescribable. My skin zinged, as I called it. I don't have another word. It's where it feels like someone has lightly shocked you, and it feels like your whole skin contracts. I didn't know if I could run anymore. My legs and lungs were burning. I was also breathing hard, almost hyperventilating. I think as I watched the brake lights go out of sight, I was now back in darkness. I was crying, I remember, and I was almost too scared to move. I really was in a scary slasher movie, I thought, or should I say, a scary squatcher movie. I was now hearing movement from that direction, and it was coming closer. I'm pretty sure I screamed, but it made me start running again. I knew the wooded area had to end at some point along that road, but I didn't know if I was going to make it. But I did. I only knew it was an open area because it just wasn't as dark on the sides of the road, and I could see another type of darkness in the distance, which I took to be another line of trees somewhere. I knew I had more trees up ahead, but I also knew I was getting closer to houses. Now I had slowed to a jog, not because I felt safer, but because my body just couldn't do it anymore. In the distance, I saw the light of something, and it wasn't moving. I took it to be a house, and I felt immense relief and almost started giggling. I don't know why. But before I reached the house, I saw another set of headlights. After the last two, I wasn't even bothering to try to flag it down, so I was surprised when it slowed down. It was my boyfriend who had felt bad enough to come looking for me once he had cooled off. I got in, and I was screaming, and I was panicked, and I wouldn't let him do anything but make a U-turn right there in the road. I refused to go back through that wooded area, even in the car. He knew something wasn't right with me, but I can barely tell him what had happened. Once we got home and I calmed down, I did tell him everything. I don't know if he believed me or not, and since we broke up a while ago, I guess it doesn't matter. In the end, the thing out there didn't hurt me, but it sure scared the daylights out of me. My advice? Don't go walking down country roads at night. Thanks a lot. Audra My name is Dale. In college, my best friend Charles and I were nicknamed Chip and Dale, and it stuck. Recently, I've been employed in Colorado's newest and what we sarcastically refer to as the recreation industry, marijuana growing. Having worked hard and been able to stash away a goodly supply of weed on the side, Chip and I were ready for a well-earned vacation. Not only had we made a lot of money, but we had enough of a pot supply scarfed off to afford a year or two off. When we needed money, we could just sell some bud and have no worries. 
To reward ourselves for our cleverness, we bought a load of equipment and supplies and headed out for a well-deserved vacation in Colorado's beautiful wilderness in my brand new Jeep. All I need to say is that we went into the Sarvis Creek Wilderness area. A lot of it is on private property, but Chip had contacts, so we were able to get into a very secluded and remote area, and after passing through Kremling and filling the gas tank and two jerry cans, we headed on the trails that I dare not reveal. We stopped long enough to pick up a buddy at the Latigo Guest Ranch before heading into the wilderness. Eventually, we'll just call him Buddy, led us to what both Chip and I agreed was the best campsite we could ever imagine. The creek we had been following wound all around the place, but where Buddy led us, the creek bed sort of circled an upraised mound, and it came almost full circle and almost met itself, and created a very wide and quite deep channel where you could clearly see trout darting here and there as you walked alongside it. About 50 yards from this mound was a beautiful stand of what Buddy said were ponderosa pines, but being originally from Florida, if it wasn't a palm tree, it was a stranger to me. There must have been several hundred of these trees of varying sizes in the center of a scenic grassy meadow. All around us, the hill sloped upward to the majestic mountains on three sides, and the almost invisible trail by which we had come up that descended into the bluish canyon. Almost dead center in this magnificent grove of ancient pines, there was an open area about 40 feet across, and it appeared to have at one time had been a log home standing there. On closer inspection, there were remains of a sort of foundation made of large stones in a kind of square, but many had been moved, and there were remnants of burned and blackened logs. On one side, the timbers were visible, and you could see plainly the remains of walls cut flat on the side and left natural on the outer walls. What a beautiful scene this must have once been. The three of us talked about how we each imagined life would have been back then, and if a person had ever known of the luxuries we would have today. This must have been grand for its time. By the time we set up the small safari tent, rebuilt the main fire pit, cut dead chunks of firewood, and organized about as good as we needed for the first night, the sun had gone beyond the tall peaks in the distance. We had enough light from the sky, but the meadows surrounding us were a hazy gray, and the forest ranged from gray to coal black. The wind had turned quite cool, and we were glad that we had dug out and enlarged the fire pit. Adding a few more large stones to the side allowed us to use the larger logs we had made short work of with Buddy's chainsaw. The roaring fire was even more comforting as soon as it became totally dark, as even the moon was covered with clouds. There we were in this huge clearing surrounded by hundred-foot pine trees, and the whole huge area lit up enough to walk around anywhere within 200 feet, as light as if it were only dusk. You could probably tell how much we were all enjoying ourselves. The next morning, we rekindled our fire, and with the camp stove going, we soon sat down at our small folding table for breakfast. It was then that Buddy asked if we had heard the Sasquatch in the night. I hadn't heard anything because my hobby had always been shooting handguns, which took care of my ears, but Chip had said he had listened to a couple of woodpeckers as they were tapping out their what he thought were messages. That's when Buddy reminded us that birds roost at night, and what the sounds had been were made by at least two maybe three Sasquatch. That came as a real shock to me, as Chip and I were more of the city slicker type. Buddy elaborated somewhat, not to frighten us, but pretty much to say that we must be constantly alert. He said we didn't need to be scared, but we had best carry handguns everywhere we went, even well in camp, just in case. That night, we all heard the rapping, because after we turned in, a series of raps came from what seemed like two or three different directions. Only this time, we all were wide awake listening. We must have discussed it on and off for two hours before finally falling asleep. The next morning at breakfast, we discovered just how close they had come. If we had happened to step out of the tent at the right time, we may have met face to face. There were tracks that plainly showed in the sandy area that we had cleared out from our fire pit about five feet out to prevent sparks from starting a fire. We carefully circled the area around us, and altogether we counted 11 footprints that, except for their huge size, could have been human. We could see them clearly enough to know that they were bare feet. Five toes, but although the toes were prominent, it looked like there were claw marks in front, 
but we couldn't be absolutely certain. It was more difficult to see more than impressions outside our main camp area, but they all three circled the jeep many times. We decided to take inventory, and it didn't appear that anything was missing, until later when we decided to go for a hike toward the nearby creek. We discovered two of our hiking staffs were gone. Buddy's was there leaning against the tent, but Chip and I had left ours leaning against a large pine about 20 feet to the side of the camp. Those will be missed because they were each six feet tall and we had bought them at a roadside outdoor shop only a month before. They were carved with Native American symbols and very ornate. This establishes that the Sasquatch have good taste. Over the next week, by leaving the occasional piece of food on our table at night, but nothing was taken, although we did find a few fresh Sasquatch footprints, but they avoided coming so close again, and it took us a few days to figure out why. We had taken to sweeping the area around our tent and campfire area in order that we might examine the area for fresh tracks each morning. The fact that they stopped walking there made us realize that they understood exactly why we were doing it. The fact was further evidenced when we very discreetly began sweeping around different areas of the camp under the guise of doing other chores. Then we again saw evidence of their having been in our camp. This cat and mouse game went on for several more days until the morning we woke up to a low-hanging smoke hovering in the air. The mountains in the distance were barely visible and the smell was faint, but definitely from wood or grass. We figured it may have been a local residence from one of the few ranches burning brush, and after the sun was full up, the smoke was gone, so we didn't pay it any more attention. Late that afternoon, we were all sitting at the place where we had first come into the meadow where the water coursed around this mound, and there in the east, we noticed what looked like a thunderstorm forming, but it had a strange look to it, and in a couple of minutes, it had shifted almost entirely back behind the mountain. Being as how thunderstorms in this country can be on you sometimes before you know it, we kept a wary eye out in that direction, but all forgot about it later. The next day, we again returned to the area of the meandering stream with fishing gear, but to no avail. We reasoned that this particular location had a bountiful supply of fish, but the rary trout could see us coming. As we were sitting on top of the small central hill, Buddy suddenly pointed toward the mountain and told us to look carefully at the base of the tree line. It took a while to concentrate my focus on the fine line between trees and grass, but there it was. A large, dark animal that at first I thought was a bear preparing to climb a tree, but it was actually walking on its hind legs. That's when Buddy said, Sasquatch. Now, knowing what it was instead of trying to force my brain to see a bear, I could plainly see the large, erect beast walking with a lurching gait that must have covered a yard with every step. Then I alerted my companions that there were two more, slightly shorter ones following close behind. The shimmering air near the ground made the Sasquatches difficult to see, but there was no mistaking the fact that they were really there. Then we could clearly see a much smaller one walking on the forested side of the two shorter Bigfoot. They soon passed behind the ridge and were gone. Coming behind them marched a group of elk, and as we watched it, it became a rather large herd moving at a quick and steady pace in the same direction. I was about to joke about a convention of the animal kingdom when there suddenly appeared a huge, steadily growing cloud in the same direction as the one we thought was a gathering storm two days before. Now, as we stood watching it in awe, it grew steadily until it covered the entire eastern sky. Then we were hit with the heavy smell of wood smoke forest fire. Even though it might have been over a hundred miles away, it could in reality only be ten miles and coming fast. There was no way to tell, so we beat feet. This turned out to be the Silver Creek Forest Fire near the Roosevelt National Forest. Since it was July of 2018, we knew that no matter what, this was the perfect combination of a long-term heat and dry terrain that forest fires thrive on. This is why we were so careful to clear extra ground around our camp, because when you're underneath these majestic pines, one spark that can destroy a thousand-year-old forest in days. Well, we fought waves of smoke on our return, but we kept the headlights on and went as fast as we could back to civilization. As abruptly as the forest fire came up, 
our lives changed. I've not seen Buddy since, and Chip moved to western Montana while I went to work for a waste disposal company in Grand Junction. My encounter with what I still believe to be a Sasquatch happened almost 16 years ago. One of my friends had won a permit to raft the wild and scenic portion of the Rogue River, so he and three other experienced rafters were making plans to raft from Grave Creek to Illahee in Washington, a trip of about 40 miles. Knowing I didn't like to raft, they asked me if I would be willing to meet them at several points along the way to refresh their supplies and drive them back to the Grave Creek boat ramp when they were done. I readily agreed, thinking it would give me plenty of time to do some hiking and camping. When we met at the boat ramp to begin our separate trips, it was agreed that I would meet them at Tucker Flat Campground in two days, as they wanted to stop and spend the first night at Winkler Bar. After helping my buddies get their supplies loaded in their raft, I waved goodbye, jumped in my truck, and headed for Tucker Flat. The Mariel Road is not the easiest route to travel on, and I soon realized I had a flat tire. I stopped to put my spare on, and it took me quite some time, as I had difficulty removing the lug nuts. It was late afternoon when I pulled into the campground, so I quickly pitched my tent and set about making dinner. I noticed there were two other tents already set up in the campground, but their occupants were nowhere to be seen. After dinner, I packed all my food into the bear-proof locker that was in the bed of my truck. This area is known for its large bear population, so I always take precautions. It was about 9 p.m. when I decided to turn in. I got settled in my tent with a lantern and a great book. I read for a couple of hours, and I just turned out my light when the ruckus started. It began with the sound of heavy footsteps, and at first, I assumed it was the people just coming back to their tents. Suddenly, I heard something breathing right outside my tent, and when I took a peek out the screen, and with a full moon out, I saw what looked like an extremely large bear standing up on its hind legs, and whatever it was began to growl and moan. Then it started pulling at my tent and dragging it away with me still inside. I kept absolutely still and silent. After several minutes, it moved off, and then I heard it thrashing around the area where the other tents were. I quietly got out of my tent and in a crouched run got over to my pickup and climbed in. After I was safely inside, I started it up and turned my headlights on, which were shining in the same direction the noises were coming from. This beast was huge, and it certainly wasn't a bear. It stopped destroying the other tents and looked towards me. It bared its teeth and started walking toward me. I threw the truck in reverse and backed out of my campsite as quickly as I dared. Once I reached the road, the beast was still in my headlights. It just stood there for a second and then turned back toward the woods. I quickly drove over to the Muriel Lodge and spent the night in my truck in their parking lot. The next morning, I was able to make arrangements to stay at the lodge for the next night and made arrangements for my rafters to stay when they arrived the next day. When my friends arrived, I did not say a word about what had happened, and I simply told them I wanted to treat them to a comfortable night's lodging before they got back on the river. Except for meeting my friends down on the river, I did not leave the lodge. After an uneventful night, the rafters got back in the water planning to spend the night at Camp Tacoma, and the next day they would land at Illahee Campground. I headed for Grant's Pass to find myself a new tent and then headed for Agnes over Bear Camp Road. I spent that night at the Singing Springs Resort. I was now very uneasy about camping alone. The next morning I arrived at the Illahee Campground in time to set up everyone's tents and I was comforted by the fact that the campground was almost full. When my friends arrived just afternoon, I was more than happy to let them tell me about their trip. They had a great time. To this day, I had not shared my story with anyone, nor have I ever returned to Tucker Flat Campground or the Muriel Lodge. The creature, which I know was a Sasquatch, stood at least seven feet tall and had very reddish-brown hair. I think its eyes were an amber color, but my light may have distorted that.
During the summer of 2000, a group of up to 10 young female hikers got the shock of their lives while walking the Moose River Camp Trail near Lion Falls in Lewis County, New York. On the afternoon of July 11th, while hiking near their summer camp, a creature was spotted in a clearing 100 yards away on the northwestern fringe of the Adirondacks. One girl noted, We came into a swamp-like area and heard some twigs snap and smelled this awful smell, then saw something moving in the trees ahead. The creature was dark, hairy, gorilla-like, and it was walking on two legs. She said it was in view for about 90 seconds, and when one of the girls screamed, it stopped and looked in their direction. The group fled back to camp, where she said the counselor suggested that they had seen a bear. She was certain it wasn't, pointing out that it walked on two legs for over a minute. She thought the counselor may have been trying to prevent a panic at the camp. In the autumn of 2002, a hiker, an avid outdoorsman, was driving near Middleport in Niagara County, New York, when he pulled into a remote driveway in hopes of spotting deer. The time was 6 p.m. As soon as he got out of his vehicle, he noticed a dark, two-legged creature moving quickly in the field about 225 yards away. Its hair was long, dark brown, and flowing as it moved, with its arms by its side as it almost seemed to float across the rocky, uneven terrain and tall grass. When I say traveled very quickly, I mean it was really moving very rapidly but at no time did it seem like it was running as you or I would look if traveling at that speed, as there was no discernible movement of its arms as it floated through the tall grass. The encounter made a deep impression on the man who said he was convinced it was a Bigfoot. In June 2003, Larry Pape of Granville reported seeing a strange creature squatting in a field off Route 22 near Comstock's Great Meadow Prison. The tiny hamlet of Comstock borders the Bigfoot hotspot of Whitehall. I slowed down and got a good look, dead on, 30 yards away, he said, staring at the squatting figure he saw a head and wide shoulders. The figure was said to have golden brown hair. He said the hair was four to six inches long and really well kept and beautiful as it blew in the breeze. It had a clean look to it, Pape said the head had a curious shape, but it was like a cross between a dog and a cat. He said the head seemed to be thicker. He could not discern any ears or whiskers. He said the creature was four feet off the ground as it crouched over and had massive shoulder blades, and its legs appeared as though they were straight out on the ground, as if it was sitting. The neck was stretched six to eight inches. Pape said he and the creature stared at each other for at least half a minute the creature remaining motionless for the entire time. The next minute, Pape said, the creature seemingly vanished before his eyes. It was like it disappeared into thin air, he said. He told reporter Patrick Ripley of the Whitehall Times, it just blew my mind. I had never seen anything like this before. And he also said, I got a really good look at it. I was pretty scared. It was just phenomenal. I'm still kind of in awe. One morning in June of 2004, two visitors from Hong Kong were spending a leisurely day fishing just north of Whitehall in the rural mountainous town of Clemens. Their fishing spot was in back of the Red Top Tavern, about 10 miles north of Whitehall. That's when they spotted a large monkey-like creature wading through the water. One of the men said it was tall and skinny and stood up in the water 60 yards away. He said its body stood at least 5 feet out of the water and was clearly visible from the waist up. He described what he saw as a monkey. He said, I remember noise and sounds, dogs barking, and then looked and saw the creature in the water up to its chest. Then it moved very fast and quickly disappeared out of view. Surprisingly, not being familiar with North American wildlife, the men didn't realize that the encounter was all that unusual and went about their fishing oblivious to the history of Bigfoot sightings in the area. One of the men said the creature resembled an orangutan with short brown and red hair. It had a flat face, he added. On June 20, 2004, three men spotted a Bigfoot-like creature in Monroe County near the town of Greece. The witnesses, aged 45, 43, and 36, 
were on a bike ride with two companions at 12.30 a.m., a ride they made about three times a week along a local bike trail. While taking a rest, they were standing around talking when their attention was drawn to a figure standing by a tree about 75 yards away. As they walked toward the figure to get a better look, it ran off down a wood line about 100 yards. They said it stood seven and a half feet tall, was covered in tan or gray fur, and ambled off into the woods on two legs. The sighting area was near the southeastern shore of Lake Ontario and situated near dense woods and wetlands. On October 15, 2004, a father and son turkey hunting duo were in a hilly forested section of Napoli in Cattaraugus County in western New York when the son spotted a strange creature at close range. The man, age 29, said he had slightly separated from his father when he could see movement ahead. Readying his weapon and expecting to see a turkey, he was suddenly startled when he saw the creature and couldn't bring himself to shoot. He said the thing was just 20 yards away. I didn't know what it was. It was on two legs, all brown-red hair all over it, and at least six feet tall. Despite being stocky, it ran swiftly down a hill and out of sight after five seconds. His father was looking in the wrong direction and saw nothing. The encounter happened at 11 a.m. at the top of a hill. Late in the morning of June 10, 2006, a motorist reported seeing a Bigfoot-like creature while driving near Minerva in Essex County. The witness had traveled seven miles along the unpaved Northwoods Club Road and was driving fast when he and his passenger, a brother, reached a bend in the road. As we turned a bend, I saw a very large, brown, furry object lunge into the dense woods up that road at the next curve, 50 yards ahead. It was obvious that the creature was in the road and was startled by my speeding SUV. As they approached, they saw what appeared to be the head and shoulders of a large creature that stood seven and a half feet tall. Its hair appeared to be a light chestnut brown. The witness was certain that it wasn't a bear and was surprised that it vanished so quickly. The thing was in sight for about three seconds. On Sunday night, September 3, 2006, at 9.40 p.m., a family was traveling through Whitehall from nearby Rutland, Vermont, on their way home to Glen Falls, when they reported seeing a Bigfoot. The driver, Rich Martin, said the figure was crossing Route 4. It stood six to seven feet tall and was covered in dark brown hair all over. The next day, four people were driving along Route 4 into Whitehall at 8.45 p.m., returning from the Rutland State Fair, 26 miles to the east. As they passed by a series of storage shed rentals near Whitehall High School, they spotted a mysterious figure standing beside the road. It had a white face and black hair, said one witness, and stood six to seven feet tall. The man who first spotted it said he waited several seconds before saying aloud, Did you guys see that? As it turns out, the driver and all three passengers glimpsed the creature. They all gave corresponding accounts and drew similar drawings of what they had seen. The driver described it as standing tall with two dark eyes close together. There was no description of red eyes, a common feature of Bigfoot reports. The sighting lasted three to four seconds, but was enough to make a lasting impression. When asked if she could have been mistaken, she replied, I definitely saw what I saw. The next month, three teenaged girls camping in rural East Whitehall got the fright of their lives while walking down a footpath some 200 feet from their campfire. The encounter took place a mile east of Old Brick Church at 10.30 p.m., when they spotted a large figure 30 feet away. It was like a human, said one girl. We all saw it at the same time, and we all screamed. Two of the trio immediately ran back towards the makeshift camp, while a third girl just froze. That thing was just standing there, said the 17-year-old. By the time she gathered her thoughts and looked around, her friends were gone. She then turned back to where the creature was standing, and it was gone. She said the creature was huge, seven feet. It petrified her. She estimated that the sighting lasted eight seconds. It was big, wide, and looked like a human shape or form, she added. Curiously, two or three weeks earlier, the girl's family said their dog was visibly upset as they heard what sounded like steps stomping around outside. 
There was no odor associated with the sighting. During January in 1989, witnesses were hiking a friend's property near the Vermont state line. One witness said, We saw footprints while walking in the woods that must have been 20 inches long and found some tree branches broken down. They were originally about 15 feet high. We decided to head back to his house right away because we both felt as if we were being watched and it was close to dark. The entire way home we felt as if we were being followed. The next morning I awoke to see a large creature about 20 feet from the house. I slept on the fold-out couch and the entire front of the house has windows. It must have been at least 10 feet tall as the windows are 15 feet off the ground and it was no more than 5 feet below me. It wandered around for a while, and I did not dare move. It was brown and looked very human except for its size and forehead, and obviously the hair. After about five minutes, it walked toward the house and up a bank. As it passed the house, it banged on the wall, and I thought its arm would come right through. My friend was awakened by this and came in, and I told him what I had seen. We decided not to go back out to follow the tracks. Whitehall, New York is a small town with little to do for teenagers, especially during the winter. Driving all the back roads was one of the pastimes of choice. Late one night in January 1981, a girlfriend and I drove out to East Bay and stopped to talk for a while. After a few moments spent parked near the bridge, I saw what looked to be a man walking across the marshy area to our left. The distance, I'm assuming, was about 200 to 300 yards. This I gauged by seeing a fence line at that distance. We both watched as this man approached the fence line. He cleared it without stopping, simply stepped over it as if it were a low stool. Knowing that the snow was not that deep or that hard to support a man of his apparent size, and that it was highly unlikely for anyone to be out on the marshes at this time of night, I stepped out of the car to get a better look. As soon as I'd gotten out of the car, the man changed course and began heading straight toward us. I closed the door to cancel the interior light and prevent showing my location. At this point, the man broke into a run. His speed was incredible. He closed the distance between us very quickly. My girlfriend was screaming for me to get back into the car at this point. I got back into the car and she drove over the bridge back into New York State. As we went, I looked behind us and saw that we were being pursued although we were building a gap. As soon as we returned to Hardtop Road, he broke off pursuit and ran back into the forest near the bridge. We returned to town and never spoke of this incident to anyone other than two trusted friends. I have since told friends and relatives that I saw something out there, but could not say that it was any animal I had ever seen, nor could it have been any man. I should add, at that time, I had spent 16 years working and playing outdoors. I had encountered all of the major predators of our area, knew their habits and habitats. I know that I did not mistake an animal for a humanoid creature that night. I spend most of my summers camping in and around the Adirondacks in my Dodge Caravan. This particular summer, in August of 2010, I had stopped at Cascade Lake to spend a few days camping. I had slept soundly the previous night and had woken up around 7 a.m. I decided to get up and start making my breakfast. I had just started the kettle on the camp stove when I looked over at Upper Cascade Lake and could see the mist rising off the surface of the lake. I grabbed my iPhone and walked about 50 yards to the edge of the lake to get a picture. As I approached the break wall, I noticed a dark brown object on the opposite side of the lake at the shore. At first, I couldn't make out what it was but it seemed to be sitting at the water's edge. I then realized it must be a bear. The animal looked like it was doing something in the water with its paws, as I could hear a faint splashing sound. I thought it would be a good idea to get a picture, so I brought my phone up to my face level and tried to focus it on the animal. As I was focusing in, the animal stood up on two legs. I was startled and pulled down my phone to see this thing with my own eyes. It took a step toward the tree line and stopped. Almost methodically, as it stopped, it turned its whole upper body to the left and stared at me for a couple of seconds. It turned back and in one step disappeared into the tree line. 
I immediately went cold and got scared. As I ran back to my campsite, my only thought was that it was going to go left or right. If it went right, it would have to go into the water, and if it went left, it was headed directly for my campsite. I decided it was best to get the hell out of Dodge, so to speak. I arrived back at my campsite in under a minute. My dog was still asleep on the front seat and didn't stir at all. I opened the passenger side sliding door of my van and started to throw all the camping gear back into the van, making quite a mess inside as I did. I closed the door and then jumped into the driver's seat and floored the gas to leave. As I was driving out, I kept looking up my left driver's side window to see if I could observe it again, but I saw nothing. I drove all the way into Lake Placid and parked at a mall parking lot to gather my thoughts and think about what had taken place. I was pretty shaken up as I kept replaying the experience over and over in my mind, trying to make sense of what I had seen. I could not ascertain its height exactly because of the distance, but I would guess that it was approximately 7 to 8 feet tall. It was covered head to toe in shaggy dark brown hair or fur. I could see the sunlight shining off its back as it turned to go into the tree line, and I could see the brown coloration as it turned away from me. When it turned to stare at me, I could not make out any facial features, but I knew that it saw me. The upper body was massive and stocky like a football player's build. It had very long arms that went well below its waist. I could also make out what I assume were the shape of hands. It walked upright and paused before slowly turning its upper body to look directly at me. It stared at me for approximately 5 to 10 seconds and turned back to face the tree line. It took one to two steps and disappeared into the forest. I could see a couple of branches move after it went into the trees. It was then I decided to leave. I did not hear anything other than the initial splashing it made in the water with its hands when I first thought it was a bear. I did not return to the area until three years later with a friend to camp. Nothing has happened on subsequent trips to the area of Cascade Lake. It was 2018. I can't remember if it was January or February. The weather in Michigan was foggy, with light, freezing drizzle, which is common for that time of year. I was driving from Twin Lake to White Cloud to investigate some real estate that my husband and I were interested in buying. The area I was in consisted of a lot of wooded areas with extremely thick patches of trees, open grasslands, and pastures. There was light agriculture in the area still, but the land was being snapped up by real estate developers. To the east, there were more rolling hills and forests. Very few people lived in that area. I was about nine miles south of the toll complex, and as I approached a bridge, I saw a reddish-brown patch of color up ahead on the right side of the road. Normally, I often saw deer along this stretch of road, so I initially thought that this must be a deer too. But when I got closer, I could see through the windshield wipers, and I realized this thing was too tall to be a deer. Since the roads were slick and had patches of ice on them, I was driving slowly, about 35 miles per hour. I saw that this thing was a dark figure, standing upright, and it was on the outside of the guardrail. I couldn't imagine why someone would be standing on the outside of the guardrail before the bridge. I knew there was a steep embankment leading down to the river level from the roadway, and I was afraid I was witnessing someone who was going to take their life. As I got closer, I was afraid to honk or flash my lights, fearing that they might jump if I startled them. I slowed down, and as I got closer, that was when I noticed that this wasn't human. It was tall, thin, and had a skinny figure. It appeared to be as tall as a basketball player, around 7 feet in height. This thing wasn't wearing any clothing, which I found extremely disturbing, especially considering the weather. That's when I noticed that its arms were extremely long, longer than what I was accustomed to seeing in humans, and it had shaggy rolls of hair hanging from its arms and body. I was certain that it looked like hair and not fur. The hair almost resembled dreadlocks, but much shorter, like clumps of matted hair on a dog. The skin on its chest area had a flesh-toned appearance, and there wasn't any hair across the upper chest. I noticed that this thing had both ape-like and human characteristics, leaving no doubt in my mind that it was really an animal. Growing up in southwestern Georgia, I had heard stories all of my life about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, but I always assumed that they were just stories and had been made up. 
I had seen several Bigfoot shows in passing, and I compared what I saw to the stereotypical description. It was pretty similar, but it did not match completely, mainly due to its thin build. All the stories that I had ever heard said that Bigfoot was quite muscular. As I began to pull closer to it, I turned on my bright lights. This creature began to raise its arm to shield its face from the high beams. It stood, motionless and stationary, as if waiting for me to pass. When I passed within 20 feet or so, I slowed down even further, to 20 miles per hour or less, and I looked over my right shoulder, but it was out of the view of my headlights. I did not see it again from that point. As I drove forward, I felt my neck hair stand up, and within a few minutes, I felt extremely nauseous. I tried to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw. As I personally didn't really believe in such things, I kept the incident to myself until I returned home late that evening and I shared it with my husband and son. While my husband laughed and made fun of me, my young son thought it was cool. Over the few weeks and months following the sighting, it continued to bother me. I decided to run a Google search to find out if other sightings had taken place in the area. To my surprise, I learned that there were several accounts of seeing Bigfoot in that area. I imagined that with the deforestation and development, it was being forced out of its natural habitat. I was excited, and I told my husband what I had found out. But my husband was quick to discourage me from submitting a report to the local sheriff or anyone else. It was the summer of 1996, and my family and I had decided to escape the chaos of the city for a peaceful weekend getaway in Illinois. We rented a cozy cabin nestled in the woods, just a stone's throw away from the beautiful beach. It seemed like the perfect place to unwind and reconnect with nature. As we settled into our new temporary home, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. The air was crisp, the surroundings were serene. This is exactly what we needed, a break from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The first day went by without a hitch. We spent hours frolicking on the sandy beach, building sandcastles, and splashing in the cool waters. Laughter filled the air as my children chased each other. Their joy was infectious. But as the sun began to set, I noticed faint sounds echoing through the woods. It was like a distant wood knocking. I brushed it off as nothing more than wildlife, or perhaps even my imagination playing tricks on me. But the next day, the wood knocking grew louder and more persistent. It seemed to follow us wherever we went on our hikes through the forest, during our picnics by the lake, even as we sat around the campfire at night. The sounds grated on my nerves, disrupting what was supposed to be a peaceful retreat. I tried my best to ignore it, focusing instead on making memories with my family. One afternoon, as my children begged me to join them in a game of catch on the beach, I couldn't help but feel torn. Part of me wanted to indulge in their innocent joy, to forget about the unsettling sounds, but another part of me yearned for peace and quiet. Reluctantly, I put on a smile and I joined my children on the beach. I threw the ball with all of my might, trying to push away the frustration and immerse myself into their world. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. The wood knocking persisted, as if it was taunting me. And as the sun began to set again, casting long shadows across the beach, a chilling thought crept into my mind. What if the source of these sounds was something more sinister than just wildlife? That night, as we gathered around the campfire to roast marshmallows, a hooting sound echoed through the woods. It was unlike anything I had heard before. It was a haunting, otherworldly cry. The atmosphere felt tense, and my whole family had unease in their eyes. Trying to maintain a sense of normalcy, I mustered a smile, and I handed out the marshmallows. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. As we sat there, the hooting continued, growing louder and more persistent. And it also seemed to be getting closer, as if whatever was responsible for the sound was drawing nearer to the cabin. I had to make a split-second decision. I told everyone I thought it was time we head inside and to call it a night. Everyone was confused and disappointed, but they trusted my judgment and began to gather their belongings. As we hurriedly made our way back to the safety of the cabin, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. That night, as I laid in bed, exhaustion finally overtook me. But just as I was about to drift off into sleep, I heard a tapping sound on my window. My heart raced, and I carefully approached the window to investigate. 
Peering through the glass, my eyes widened in disbelief. There, standing just beyond the tree line, was a creature that looked like Bigfoot, towering and covered in shaggy hair. Its eyes seemed to glow, and it stared directly at me. I got the sudden feeling that maybe we were not welcome here. I couldn't believe my eyes. Was this some sort of hallucination brought on by exhaustion? I rubbed my eyes, hoping that the creature would disappear, but it stayed there. It gave three loud hoots and then disappeared into the forest. I was panicked, and I stumbled back from the window. Just as I was about to wake my wife and children, I looked out the window again, but the Bigfoot was no longer there. The tapping on the window stopped, and there was an eerie silence. The events of the past few days had shattered my sense of security and left me questioning almost everything. The next day, I had decided, much to my family's disappointment, to end our vacation early. Sadly, I decided to make up a lie and say how for the last days of our family vacation, we would go to a water park and make it a tradition. My wife eyed me suspiciously, but didn't push me any further because she did love water parks. To this day, I have never told her what I saw, and I hope to never return to that cabin. In 2008, I had a co-worker who arrived at work one day looking pretty upset. She shared with me that she had a terrifying encounter while driving, claiming to have seen a large creature crossing the road right in front of her car. Being curious about such things, I asked her for specific details. At that time, I didn't know much about cryptids or Bigfoot, but I was pretty intrigued, and I wanted to see if there was anything to discover. That weekend, I decided to venture out to the spot where my coworker had had her encounter. It was a pretty remote area, approximately two miles out of town, surrounded by farmland, mainly consisting of cornfields. I gathered my gear, which was simply a backpack with water and snacks, and embarked on my search by venturing into the cornfields. It didn't take long before I stumbled upon a game trail. Intrigued, I followed the trail, and it led me to a clearing. At first, I couldn't quite make out what I was seeing, but as I looked closer, I realized that I was walking on what appeared to be a bone bed, there were numerous small animal bones scattered throughout the area, along with larger remains of a deer. These deer remains seemed to be a mix of roadkill, partial hunting kills, or taxidermy remnants. The deer skeletons had no heads that had been discarded over the bluff's edge. With all of these remains strewn about and a clear path leading to a lakefront, it became evident to me why an animal might be drawn to this place, possibly making regular visits to scavenge easy meals before crossing the road. With this newfound understanding, I decided to leave the area and returned the following month. That's when things took a turn for the creepy. I arrived back at the site around 7.30am the next day. It was an incredibly foggy morning, perhaps the foggiest in the history of this county. The lake was enveloped in a thick fog, and there was condensation all around the area, especially along the bluff and trail. My intention was simply to retrieve the camera that I had set up on a tree and quickly make my way back to the car. I left the car unlocked and ready to go, grabbed the camera, and noticed that it had been tripped three or four times. Curiosity got the better of me, and I was eager to see if I had captured any pictures, so I promptly headed back towards the bluff. As I walked, I heard something pacing me in a large gully about 40 feet to the left. It didn't concern me initially, as I had never encountered anything there during my previous visits. Additionally, I faintly heard a conversation nearby, presumably between two men on a boat in the lake, making their way under the bridge. About halfway up the trail, the sounds of movement briefly stopped. They seemed to shift further to the left, in the direction of the voices that I had heard. Taking note of this, I continued my ascent. But as I approached the turnaround point, I no longer heard any movement, so I began putting the camera away in the back of my car, a Honda Element with a rear hatch. As I stepped back to shut the hatch, I caught a strong smell, reminiscent of a wet dog. Surprisingly, when I stepped back towards the car, the smell was hardly detectable. A breeze was blowing from my right side, and when I shut the rear gate and turned to the right, I caught sight of a figure suddenly standing up about 80 feet away in the tree line near the bridge. It appeared to be a broad-shouldered, hulking figure without a head, but as I focused my gaze, I noticed a darker area between its shoulders, and it dawned on me that it was a face held low in either a peering or aggressive stance. In retrospect, 
I believe it may have heard the rear hatch slam and mistakenly thought it was a car door, possibly anticipating my departure. For a few seconds, it stood still, but then it began swaying from side to side, lowering and raising itself while intently peering at me. The impression that I got was that this creature was elderly, judging by its behavior, peculiar posture, and coloration. I began to make out its features, gray chest hair running wider at the center line of the neck, and honey brown reddish hair along its arms and body. It had remarkably wide shoulders and massive low hanging arms. In the midst of observing this creature, I heard another snippet of conversation drifting up from the lake, followed by laughter. And then the creature emitted a loud bellow that could only be compared to an angry bull. It started moving in my direction, and at that moment, a much stronger odor, reminiscent of rotting meat, engulfed the air. Feeling the urgency to leave, I decided to get into the car, but as I turned to walk around to the driver's side, the creature scolded me in a deep, low, bassy language, which only increased my sense of trespassing and trouble. A combination of its yelling, the odor, and the surge of adrenaline left me disoriented for a few seconds. I felt an unexplainable, instinctual urge to sit or lie down on the ground, much like a prey animal might react, but I resisted that impulse and I quickly climbed into the car, glancing back at the creature. It hadn't changed its position since I had gone out of its field of view behind the car. It continued to peer intently at me. In that moment, I did the only sensible thing that I could think of. I fixed my gaze upon the creature, noting its position in relation to the guardrail and the top of my side window. Unfortunately, in my panicked state, it didn't even register to me that I was still clutching the pistol that I usually carried in the field for protection against coyotes and now black bears. The pistol was lying on the passenger car seat, so I unholstered it and watched through the half-open passenger window. The creature let out another loud grunt, and it began moving towards the car, staying close to the guardrail that ran across the bridge. I admit, I was in a sheer state of panic, so I pointed the gun out the window, aiming it towards the ground, and I fired two shots. The irrational part of me hoped that the creature, now clearly visible as a large bipedal hairy being, would seize its approach. Meanwhile, the rational part of me believed that if it behaved like an animal, it would bolt upon hearing the shots. On the other hand, if it was somehow a human being, it would either yell something like don't shoot or make a swift escape. But the creature's reaction was neither. It simply stopped in its tracks, now standing just 30 feet away, and it stared. Unfortunately, I forgot that the gun was still in my hand. As I went to shift the car into drive, I accidentally fired another round directly into the center console. The sound vibrated against the confines of my Honda Element, which was essentially a big metal box. And then, I sped away from the scene, my ears ringing from the gunshot. When I arrived back at the farm, it became apparent to me that my car had sustained damage. The windows were unresponsive, and upon inspecting the console, I discovered that the wiring harness had completely fallen apart. I spent the rest of that morning arranging for a car hauler to come pick up the vehicle and tried to tell my family what had happened, who were attending the reunions. Eventually, I left Louisville with the damaged car. Since then, there have been additional events at the location. The area has since been cleaned up, fenced off, and heavily posted with no dumping signs. But direct sightings of the creature have not been reported, and the investigation is ongoing. To provide a detailed description of the creature, it stood at approximately 7.5 feet in height, with massive shoulders spanning around 3.5 feet across. Its arms hung low, while its abdomen appeared thin. I determined its size by returning to the location a couple of weeks later with others, and using an extending paint pole to measure the distance from where I had parked to the spot where I had fixed its position. The creature's chest was covered in gray hair, which transitioned to an almost white coloration at the center line and neck. Its face, resembling that of a black gorilla, lacked distinct features, but I noticed a larger, flattened, almost human-like nose with a crease running down the center. Although I couldn't see its teeth, there was a darker area where the mouth was located, which occasionally moved and formed shapes when it vocalized. Its eyes were dark and devoid of color. The head was rounded, not conical, and it appeared as though the hair on top was slightly thinning, revealing a glimpse of a dark scalp. I didn't notice any visible tears on its face, as far as I could tell. The encounter left me shaken, and forever changed. 
To this day, I continue to reflect on that spine-chilling experience, pondering the true nature of the creature that I encountered that foggy morning. I used to do crazy things when I was younger. At least they seem crazy now. Though at the time, they seemed normal, just something to do. One of these activities was climbing alone, which of course entailed hiking and camping alone to get to the climb. I thought nothing of loading up my backpack and heading out into some of the most rugged and wild country in the lower 48 for a week or two, and I often didn't even bother to tell anyone where I was going. Maybe I had what they call a death wish, but I think it was more like being in denial. I didn't think anything could or would happen to me. I acted like I was invincible, but I definitely wasn't. One beautiful summer day, I decided to head out for a few days of climbing around the Ice Lakes Basin area, near Silverton, Colorado, high in the San Juan Mountains. I had my eye on several peaks, including Golden Horn and Vermilion, both over 13,000 feet. I knew I would see few, if any other climbers, as most people were doing the big wall climbs and the 14ers, those peaks over 14,000 feet. That left this wild country all to me, though I've heard it's become more crowded in the years since this happened in the mid-1990s. Ice Lakes Basin is a stiff climb when wearing a backpack, and mine was loaded to the gills. I left my old beater car at the trailhead and took off in mid-afternoon. I had hiked the trail before, and I knew I had time to get to the basin before dark, even though it was steep and a bit hard on the knees. I tend to bring everything I might need. I'd rather be prepared than travel light, I guess. I always regretted bringing so much stuff, as I seldom used it all. But the rare time that I needed something, I was sure to have it. I made it to the basin just as darkness fell, and like I predicted, I hadn't seen another soul. Lower and upper ice lakes are both relatively small, but glaciated lakes right at the timberline, set in a basin beneath some impressive peaks. I planned to camp the next night at the upper basin, which has an old mining cabin at its edge and has seen better days, though it is still standing. It was next to Fuller Lake, with Fuller Peak towering above. I had my little tent up in no time, and my stove out with water boiling for a freeze-dried meal of spaghetti. Even freeze-dried stuff tastes good when you're outdoors. After dinner, I just sat and looked at the stars in amazement. I have never seen stars like what you see in the San Juans. It's a combination of thin atmosphere from the high altitude and clean air, and the sky unfolds layer after layer of stars, so thick that you feel totally insignificant. It's beautiful, although humbling. It's always cold at night when you get into the higher altitudes like that and even though it was late August, I had on my sweater and down coat, and I was still chilly. I was also tired, so I went to bed soon after sunset, which was in itself worth the hike up there. It was so colorful. Lots of mare's tails that picked up a wide range of pinks and purples, and even oranges. I should have taken more notice that they were mare's tails, but I was tired. I was sleeping well, which was good as I sometimes can't sleep at all at altitudes above 11,000 feet, when suddenly I woke up with a start. Something had just torn apart a big log not too far from my tent. Whatever it was then dropped it, making the ground shake. I had noticed the log earlier, and it was huge, especially considering it was at Timberline, where trees struggle to make a living. That log was about three feet across, though not very long. Whatever had picked it up had to be a big, strong animal. My first thought was a bear, as they'll do that, break logs to get at the grubs inside. But it must be a big bear, and there wasn't supposed to be anything in this area but black bears, which typically don't get that big. Maybe it was a remnant grizzly, I thought, as the last known grizzly in the San Juans was killed in the early 1970s. But maybe this one had survived? The longer I laid there, the more scared I got. If that were a grizz, I would easily be dinner, and this tent would provide absolutely no defense. All I had was my pocket knife, so I would be history. I could now hear footsteps, and whatever it was, this thing was very heavy, and the ground kind of shook a bit as it walked. Was it coming my way? God, I was scared. I had to do something quickly. I really didn't even think about this, but I sat up and felt around in my pack until I found my little cooking pan and I pulled it out. 
I then found a spoon and my headlamp, crawled out of my little tent, and turned on the light, and I started yelling and dancing around in circles while banging on the pan with a spoon and wailing. I did this until I was tired. I don't know, maybe five minutes? When I stopped, I was out of breath, but I shined my headlamp all around and I saw nothing. After standing there a while and listening, I crawled back in and went to sleep. Whatever it was, I had obviously outweirded it. I woke the next morning to blue skies and I immediately went over to investigate the log. Now I was really creeped out, because all around the log were footprints, but they weren't bear prints, but it looked like photos I've seen of big footprints. I realized I was hyperventilating. I looked all around me, but I saw no sign of anything. I had obviously scared it off. Thinking about it later, it makes me laugh at the thought that such actions could scare Bigfoot away, but my ignorance was bliss. It had probably enjoyed the show, thinking about how crazy humans are. Actually, I wasn't feeling blissful at all, but I was scared. I didn't even make coffee or breakfast or anything. I just quickly broke camp and stuffed everything in my pack. It was time to get out. I started back down the trail and then I stopped. Getting away from the scene made me feel better, and I decided to stop and make breakfast. It was a beautiful, sunny, bluebird day. Why would I run away? The creature wouldn't bother me now. It was long gone, and now it was daylight. I relaxed a bit, and I made some freeze-dried eggs, and bacon, and then coffee. I felt much better. Why was I leaving again? Oh, a Bigfoot? Didn't they not exist? I turned around, and I went back up the trail. I'd come to climb, and I was nearly there. The hard part was done, getting up to the lower basin, and the upper basin wasn't that far. I'd go on up, climb Goldenhorn, and then decide whether to leave. The day was young. I could still get out by dark if I hustled. I left my pack by a landmark rock, and I made up a day pack, and then I proceeded to climb the mountain. It was aptly named, the top being a glaciated horn. I was excited to make the summit, and I sat there a while, looking down on Trout Lake on the other side of the drainage. Massive and impressive peaks surrounded me. So many peaks, but so little time. I noticed a little bit of a breeze picking up, and then I could see a thick band of dark clouds to the west. A storm was coming in. It was then that the previous day's mare's tails clicked, and I realized something big was coming, not just a small storm. I needed to get out. My decision had been made for me. By now it was mid-afternoon. I had dawdled a bit and was running behind schedule. I planned to get out by dark, but it was still doable. I just needed to get a move on. But you don't want to hurry down a mountain when you're tired and likely to slip, so it took a while before I got back to my pack. There was no sign of anyone, and the breeze had died down to a stillness that seemed unnatural. I knew it was only a few hours on down to my car, mostly an easy downhill hike, so I made myself a peanut butter jelly sandwich and enjoyed what were to be my last moments in the basin. It was so beautiful, and I hated to leave. I pulled out my camera, and I took some photos, trying to make a panorama that I could glue together later. All of a sudden, literally from nowhere, a stiff wind hit. It nearly knocked me off my feet, shrieking and carrying red dust from Utah that quickly obscured the basin. Within minutes, I was in the middle of a gale-force windstorm with almost zero visibility. I couldn't believe that conditions could change that fast. Apparently, that dark cloud was bringing in some really nasty weather. I quickly managed to get my big pack onto my back and head down the trail with a sense of urgency. The wind was bitter cold, cutting literally right through me. I could barely stay on my feet, and it had gotten noticeably darker. It was soon spitting snow, making everything slick. I felt like such an idiot. What kind of outdoorsman would ignore all the obvious signs? This was the kind of ignorance that led to people reading about your demise in the paper and commenting on how stupid you were. The Darwin Award, they called it. Climber goes alone, tells no one, sees signs of a major storm all over the place, ignores the signs, oh, and a Bigfoot, throw that in for good measure. Now I was in a full-on blizzard, and it had been only 20 minutes ago I was blissfully eating a PBJ on a rock in the sunshine. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and I knew how fast conditions could change. Yet here I was, stumbling down a rocky trail that would lead me in a couple of hours to the safety of my car, if only I could see where to go. 
The visibility got worse and worse, and I could no longer even make out the trail. Where the heck was I? I needed to stop and set up my tent and hunker down, before I got totally lost. But the winds were so vicious, I wasn't even sure I could get my tent up. And what if it snowed several feet? My little tent would be totally buried. Now I was worried sick. How did I get into this predicament? And then I could barely make out something dark nearby, and it didn't look like a rock or a tree. It was the old cabin. I had somehow managed to stumble upon the old cabin. The door was laying there on the ground, so I just went on in. It was weird, having the winds drop off. As soon as I was inside, there was no wind pushing me around, and I could kind of gather my senses. This cabin was old and decaying and musty, with one corner kind of collapsing, but it had stood there for at least a hundred years, so I guessed I could safely spend a night there without worry. It was now almost completely dark from the storm, so I pulled out my headlamp and I proceeded to organize my camp around me before it got pitch black. My down sleeping bag would probably get me through the night. I'd just have to pray that I didn't get snowed in. I spread my pad out and shook out the bag, hoping that there weren't any critters in the cabin that would want to sleep with me. I sat there for a while, and then I decided to make some dinner. Freeze-dried beef stew. The winds howled on as I slowly ate. After that, there was nothing to do but hunker down in my bag and try to stay warm. It was only about six or seven in the evening, but it was dark. I was soon fast asleep, the wind raging outside. I had climbed a big mountain, so I was tired. Plus the lack of oxygen at that altitude makes you want to sleep. It must have been about midnight when I woke up. The winds were unbelievable. I went to college in Boulder, and I once was in 70 mile per hour winds there, and these seemed even higher. The whole cabin was shaking, and I wondered if the old structure would make it through. I can't begin to describe the fury of the winds. It was as scary as it could get. I got out of my bag and shined my light out the door. The snow had stopped, which was good. I might be able to get out as soon as daylight came. It looked like there was only about three or four inches on the ground. It was then that I noticed a faint odor, like a cross between something dead and a ripe garbage can. It was inside the cabin. I hadn't noticed it before. Had I just missed it from all the craziness of trying to get settled and survive? It definitely was not there before I decided, as I have a sensitive nose and I would have smelled it no matter what. It was puzzling. I crawled back into my bag, wanting to preserve the warmth. I laid there, trying to get back to sleep, but this smell had me puzzled. What was it? Was it just the smell of the old cabin? Maybe. But in these winds, any smells should be over in Silverton or beyond by now as the cabin was getting lots of ventilation. Something didn't feel right. I finally drifted back off, warm in my bag, still tired. I have no idea how long I slept before I woke again. The odor was now stronger, and a sixth sense told me to lay completely still. There was something in the cabin with me. Something alive and smelly. I didn't dare turn on my light or even move. I was terrified. What if it was the creature from last night? I laid there, frozen. I finally heard something over in the corner opposite me, which must have been loud to be heard over the wind, so I listened. It was someone snoring. Oh my god, there was someone in here, and they were really big to make that kind of snore. And now, I needed to pee, but I didn't dare move, and that only added to my misery. I laid there as the wind howled and the night slowly wore on, wondering if I was dreaming. Finally, I gave up, slipped out of my bag, peed in the corner of the building, and then crawled back into bed. After crawling back into my bag, I could see two red eyes shining in the darkness. They had nothing to reflect off of. They were shining with their own energy, and I was again brutally terrified. I had an overwhelming urge to sleep, and I tried to fight it, but I couldn't. I drifted off. Whatever it was, if it wanted to harm me, there wasn't much I could do about it and it seemed like it was just seeking shelter, like I was. I thought about this later, and I really did fight that sleeping feeling. I wanted to stay awake with all of my might, as I was afraid of dying in there, but I just couldn't. It was almost like I had been drugged. I woke at dawn, and the creature was gone. The winds had stopped completely, and a soft snow was falling. I quickly gathered my gear and headed down the hill. 
The trail was mostly covered with snow, but it wasn't hard to make out the way, just go down. A few hours later, I found my car. It had about six inches of snow on it, and it was now snowing harder. I cleaned off the windshield, prayed it would start, which it did, and then cranked the heater and left. I barely made it to the highway, sliding and skidding, as the Forest Service Road wasn't plowed. It was August, for God's sake. I drove into Silverton and got a hotel room. No way was I going to try to get over Red Mountain Pass in a snowstorm. I hated driving it when it was dry. I think I slept all day, as I don't really remember much, except luxuriating in the warmth and security. I did wake several times in terror, thinking I could hear loud snoring. I knew what was making the sound up in that cabin, because I saw its footprints in the snow as I headed out. At least 20 inches long, and with five toes, what I'd call a Bigfoot. In the summer of 1988, when I was just a little girl of eight years old, my family decided to take a vacation to the best place, the Ozarks. I don't remember what the name was, but it was very family-oriented. I loved playing in the forest as a girl. Our campsite was nestled in the heart of nature. It even had some swings on the trees. The campground put these huge cartoon figures out that looked like they were various playground equipment. Some were slides, and other were teeter-totters. I thought this was pretty swanky as a kid. They even had them off trails or rest areas. This campground had everything. So it was no surprise when one evening, as the sun began to set, my parents and I decided to take a hike along one of the many winding trails that crisscrossed the area. I remember the air was thick with the scent of pine, and the sounds of chirping birds and rustling leaves filled my ears. Every year, I lived for this experience. We ventured deeper into the woods, and I was so happy to be there with my parents. But that was soon shattered by an eerie hooting noise that pierced through the forest. We waited a minute to hear anything else, but nothing sounded. I remember thinking, wow, that must be the biggest owl ever. We kept walking until we came across a bench. My parents needed a break, and I wanted to keep exploring. They told me to stay where they could see me as I wandered nearby. I heard the hooting again, and I saw my parents drawn into conversation. That's when I saw one massive cartoon character. I had walked this trail before and wondered what kind of adventure awaited me. I kept hearing the hooting, and it only seemed to be coming closer. Curiosity got the better of me, and against my parents' warnings, I veered further off the path and followed the sound. The hooting abruptly stopped, replaced with this odd long scratching noise. I walked closer to the new playground piece. The scratching grew louder with each step, echoing through the forest. What looked like hard lines from far away began to soften and look furrier. I wondered if there were branches scraping up against it. After all, it was in the bush. I recall feeling a bit angry at them for not taking good care of one of these playground creatures. My mind raced with thoughts of what could be causing such a disturbing noise. And then I saw it. The massive playground creature stood up and emerged from behind a cluster of trees. Its hulking form silhouetted against the sunlight. It was a Bigfoot. I laughed at myself, thinking, well, I guess I can't be too mad now. My laughter quickly turned to fear, as it had gripped me like never before. My small frame trembled as I took in the sight before me. A creature that shouldn't be standing in front of me, but here I was, looking like an ant next to this thing. I stood frozen in place as this creature slowly turned its gaze towards me. In that moment, time seemed to stand still. This creature's eyes bore into mine. Its shaggy fur, a mix of earthy browns and deep blacks, glistened in the fading light. Each strand seemed to hold a story of its own. Even though it was shaggy, I thought it was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. I gazed into its face, and I was dumbstruck by the intensity of its eyes. Deep pools of darkness stared right back at me, and holding my breath, I just stood there gawking at him. And then this creature just vanished into the woods. The scratching noises and hooting stopped, leaving behind a silence that hung heavy in the air. I stood there, my heart was pounding in my chest, realizing that it could have been much worse, though. 
At least Bigfoot had chosen to disappear rather than to confront me. And then my parents were calling out for me. I didn't know how I found the physical strength to move, but I did. I told them that I thought I had seen one of the cartoon characters, but it was only Bigfoot. At first they laughed about it, and when they saw that I was being completely serious, they stopped laughing. I think there was this speech about never speaking of this again to anyone, or rather never telling anyone what I had seen ever again. The one thing I know for sure, ever since that day, I never looked at the playground cartoon figures the same again. The Wood Apes first visited my home when I was only a child. I'm inclined to say that I was about five when it happened, but I was so young at the time that I can't recall my exact age. Although I don't want to reveal where it took place for safety reasons, I'll just say that I lived in a modest-sized town in Northern California. One of the most interesting things about my experience is that the town that it occurred in isn't that rural. It's certainly far more common to hear about there being Bigfoot sightings in more remote regions than in suburban or inner city areas, yet the latter is where my sighting took place. My parents got divorced when I was quite young, and I ended up living at my stepfather's house after my mom remarried. We lived on a safe street that didn't lead to an outlet, so there wasn't even much traffic. I was a shy kid, but I remember my stepfather always tried to get me to warm up to him by buying me all sorts of cool toys. One time after I got home from preschool or daycare, he had what was called a G.I. Joe Power Wheels waiting for me in the driveway. I've since been told that it was something I often nagged my mom to buy me. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Power Wheels, it's like a slow electric go-kart that is intended for young kids. They were hot commodities in the early 90s, and if you were one of the lucky kids to get your hands on one of them, you became an instant celebrity among your pals. Some people might think this was a bit irresponsible, but because my stepdad had an incredibly long driveway, they allowed me to drive the thing around outside by myself. I can vividly recall how I was forbidden to go anywhere near the street, so at least they did do a good job of getting me to abide by that one rule. My stepdad was a regular guy who was gone for most of the day working on his white-collar career. However, sometimes when he came home from the office, he would immediately head outside to chop wood. I'd later come to learn from my mom that this was one of his techniques for letting off steam. Due to his habit of this, there was always a large pile of chopped wood lying on a patch of grass near the basketball hoop. There was this one day where I was riding up and down the driveway in my power wheels when I thought I saw someone quickly walk over and duck behind the mound of chopped wood. I should probably mention that this driveway wasn't straight. About three quarters of the way up the driveway, you could veer left and park by the front door. Or if you went straight, you would end up in the garage. I was finishing a loop around the circle when I saw the figure duck for cover. I didn't really think too much of it at first because I think I just figured it had to be my mom or someone visiting the house. I was aware that my stepfather was out of town on business, so I knew it couldn't have been him. I can't really remember being frightened in that moment. If anything, I'd say I was just more curious about why someone would be hiding from me. I'm sure that I had continued to drive around the loop a second time when I looked towards the woodpile and saw what I called a forest person, run out from the side of the pile that was opposite where I had come in. I was probably about 50 yards away when I saw it come out of hiding. The weirdest thing about it was how it zigzagged across the grass until it disappeared. I've been to the zoo many times since then, and I've noticed that the chimps and a few other kinds of primates behave in a very similar fashion to what I saw on that day. It could have been due to how far away I was, but I don't remember being overly surprised by its size. It was kind of crouched over, but it didn't come across to me that it was much bigger than any of the adult men I knew. However, its shape and proportions were noticeably abnormal. It looked much top-heavier than a regular human, but in a muscular sort of way. While staying in the tiny electric vehicle, I called out for my mother a couple of times, but there was no answer. 
I stayed put for a couple of minutes before I eventually stepped out of the power wheels and walked up to our front door. When I found my mom upstairs, I tried to explain to her as best as I could about what I had just seen, but her reaction was predictable. She just laughed and told me that the game I was playing with my imaginary friend sounded like a lot of fun. Truth be told, I also probably wasn't very exact or descriptive at the time, but I left her room feeling frustrated that she wasn't listening to me. I remember going into the various rooms of the second floor and staring out the windows for long periods of time, hoping that I'd see something to satisfy my curiosity. At the time, the book, Where the Wild Things Are, was a bedtime hit, and I'm convinced that that book was the only reason that I was more curious rather than afraid during that initial sighting. I don't think it was more than a few days later, when I was outside in my driveway, riding my power wheels again, I suddenly noticed a dark shape standing in the woods, not all that far off from where the woodpile was located. Though it was completely motionless, I only noticed it because it was a different shade than the rest of the environment. I also probably wouldn't have even acknowledged it if it wasn't for what I had seen only a few days earlier. The ease with which it blended into its surroundings now makes me think that these wood apes are probably around us a heck of a lot more than we would ever imagine. I remember hitting the brakes on my power wheels and just staring at the figure that was partially obscured by the hanging leaves. I could see one of its eyes. After a little more time passed, both of us remaining frozen like statues, I wondered why it didn't seem to blink. I have the visual of that unblinking eye burned into my retinas. It was like a black marble that was much larger than a human's eyeball. It's strange that I have that memory, because the more I've thought about it since, the more I've realized that I was parked a considerable distance from the figure. Therefore, it must have been looking at me with really wide eyes to give me the impression that its eyeball was so large. In fact, the figure was so completely still that I remember wondering if someone had placed a large wooden sculpture in the woods. This trend of us staring at one another lasted for a good amount of time before my intuition told me to turn my miniature vehicle around and drive away. It was like I had this instinct that I should avoid further eye contact, almost as if it would be rude or provocative to continue doing so. After I did another lap around the loop in front of our house, I glanced in the direction of the woods and the figure was completely gone. However, it had to have only just left, because I distinctly remember how, although all else was stationary, the branches in that area swayed. As I continued to sit in my little vehicle, glancing around for any sign of the figure, I heard the front door open. Out walked my mother with the telephone in hand. Her voice was jittery, and I could tell right away that something was wrong. I, I'm not sure, she said to the person on the other line. They just didn't look right, like they might have been on something. She quietly but quickly grabbed my hand and ushered me out of the vehicle and towards the house. She continued to look around as she listened to the person on the other end of the line. I somehow knew to remain quiet until after we stepped inside the house. Thank you, I will, my mother said as she hung up the phone and then locked the door behind her. When I asked what was the matter, she did her best to play it down by turning on her playful voice and tickling me as she nudged me into the kitchen. She immediately picked up the phone again and called my stepdad. I sat in front of the small kitchen television, watching TV, but I could hear her asking my stepdad if there was anyone at all who he could think of that would have had a reason to come to the house unannounced. I know that sometimes the electricity company employees did that from time to time, so that's probably the type of thing she was hoping he would say. But I'm sure that she got even more worried when she came outside to get me and realized that there were no vehicles parked in the driveway. I've always wondered what she saw on that day, and since then, she's always been a bit vague when explaining it. It's kind of like her brain is trying to suppress the memory because it's too traumatic to dwell on. Soon after we had gone inside, there was a knock on the door, and my mother let a couple of police officers in. She made me stay in the kitchen, but my curiosity got the best of me, and I snuck around the corner to try and hear what they were saying. I couldn't understand much of what they said, but I did hear my mother mention how she saw a nude intruder run across the yard and head into the woods that surrounded the property. 
I believe the officers took another look around the area, but couldn't find anything. I didn't see any signs of the wood apes for years after that, and I believe this is because after that situation, my mother stopped allowing me to be outside by myself. I then saw them again when I was 11 years old. I was watching a movie with a babysitter while both my mother and stepfather were out of town for their anniversary. I was completely immersed in the movie when my babysitter, Julie, started screaming at the top of her lungs. She jumped off the sofa and began to cower behind it. I saw she was facing the window, so with my heart already racing, I looked over and saw two dark, very tall figures looking at me through the glass. My perceptions of the world had changed from when I was younger, so I found these beings to be much more intimidating than when I was only five. Because of this, I hopped off the couch and ran upstairs and hid in the common area, which was away from any windows. I think I felt more secure in that position because I could see and hear what was going on downstairs. I heard Julie jog over to the phone and call the police. I'm not at all surprised that it was a very similar outcome to the last time the police were summoned. They found nothing and they said they would keep an eye on the property. That was the last time I ever saw anything like that, though there were a few occasions where each of us admitted to hearing very unusual noises during the night. I was 13 when we moved out of that house and out of the state altogether. We ended up moving to New York City, a place that made those previous experiences feel even more surreal. My stepfather has since passed, but he claimed to have never seen anything out of the ordinary while living there. There's still a chance that he could have been in denial, but I'll never know. I've always wished that there was a way I could get in touch with that babysitter through social media, but neither my mother nor I can remember her last name. I was a nail technician working at a salon in Oregon. One day, after a long day of work, I decided to go for a hike in the nearby woods to clear my head. Day in and day out, I'm working my butt off over people's nails. This was in 1996, and there was no doom scrolling to take my mind away from a particularly awful day. I decided to head to the Trail of Ten Falls. It's about an hour from where I work and live. It's one of the best places to go if you love solitude and waterfalls. It's huge, and it's a great place to disappear from people. The forest was peaceful and calm, and I felt at ease as I walked through the trees. I decided to rest by one of the waterfalls and dip my feet in. I usually do this to rip the stress away, and in any normal situation, it works like a charm. But today, I just couldn't seem to shake off my stress. I remember thinking how stupid I was for holding on to so much drama. Even though the waterfall is incredibly loud, I can still hear all the animals and wind flowing in their environment. I think that's one of those things that I love about this area. That's why when it got so quiet, it was so weird. Aside from the splashing water, I couldn't even hear the sloshing of the fish. And then there was a rustling sound coming from the bushes ahead of me. It was so loud in the quiet forest that I could have jumped on a branch and clung like a cat, but instead, I decided to stay as still as I could. At first, I didn't think anything of it. Maybe it was just a small animal or the wind. But as I got closer, I saw a huge figure towering across from me. The trees split, revealing what I first thought was a bear, and I was terrified. My heart flip-flopped all over the place as I recognized it. It was a Bigfoot. There was nothing in my being that could come up with any other explanations. It was very obviously a bipedal ape creature. I stood there frozen as it approached me, its massive steps shaking the ground beneath me. I tried to back away slowly, but it was getting closer and closer. And just as I thought I was done for, it stopped and looked me up and down. Within a moment, all the drama at the salon didn't seem to matter. The creature's massive frame was covered in thick, dark fur, and each strand of hair stood out against its muscular body. Its broad shoulders and powerful limbs were a testament to its primal might. The stature alone was truly remarkable. This thing stood at least eight feet tall, its hulking form casting a shadow over the surrounding rocks. Its long arms hung by its sides, ending in hands with fingers that seemed capable of crushing boulders. As I studied its face, I couldn't help but be captivated by its features. 
its deep-set eyes, were framed by a prominent brow ridge. It had a strong jawline and a wide mouth that revealed rows of sharp teeth. I thought it was going to attack me. I remember thinking that I was in a bad situation, and the last thing I said to my coworkers was, screw you. I would never have a chance to make amends for what happened or why I was so angry. In that moment, I was convinced I was going to die, but instead, it just stood there, staring at me with its glowing red eyes. It felt like hours that we just stood there staring at each other. I was too scared to move, even if it seemed like it wasn't going to harm me. It blinked at me, and I blinked at it. And then finally, after what felt like a lifetime, it turned and walked away. I stood there shaking for a while, and then I ran back to the salon as fast as I could. The experience was terrifying, and I never went hiking alone in those woods again. I still get chills every time I think about it. After returning to the salon, I was completely shaken up and scared. I could barely get a hold of myself, and my hands were still shaking. I told my colleagues about what happened, but I changed the creature to a bear, but they still didn't believe me. They thought I was making it up to scare them, so I just kept quiet, and I tried to go back to work as usual, and I tried to forget all about it. But after this experience, I realized that it's important to be aware of your surroundings and take precautions when hiking in the woods, especially if you're alone. Always carry a map, a compass, and a charged phone, and tell someone where you're going and when you expect to be back. I hope my encounter serves as a cautionary tale to others who may be considering a hike in the Oregon woods.